Good evening, everybody. We're going to get started. Um, so welcome. Thank you for being here tonight. We are, um, we are live streaming as well, so welcome all the people who are watching um, on our YouTube channel uh, as well. A couple of things that I just wanted to, uh, as a top of welcoming you, uh, there was a very different presentation planned about 90 minutes ago, uh, but news that has come to us in the last 90 minutes has given us a little, uh, had caused us to have to change our presentation tonight because we have some new information. But before we get into that, I'm going to ask Mrs. Hydecker just to talk about some of the other things that we're doing as far as um, reaching out and, and talking to, to our community about the budget and communicating. So just going to give a couple of examples of new things we're doing. Great. So as you guys know, we've been live streaming for a few years now. But tonight we're trying something different. We're live streaming from YouTube. And we're going to be offering an interactive chat. So if you uh, log on to youtube.com slash KingstonCSD, you'll be able to chat your question to the superintendent. And I will relay, relay that question to him um, during our question, answer, and sharing session. And coming up on Monday, we're going to do another um, live stream of YouTube from the KHS TV studios, which will be hosted by the students. And People will be able to ask questions in the same way, as well as on Twitter by tweeting at KingstonCSD, which is our Twitter handle. And if you're not familiar with YouTube or Twitter and you still want to participate in this digital forum, you can email the questions to me, kheidecker at kingstoncityschools.org. And if you're not on email or Twitter or YouTube, you can always call Camille DeBerna, the district clerk. Um, so that's what we're doing as far as our digital outreach. Okay. Great. Thank you. So, as I said, we had a much different presentation, and, and actually now we have a much more abbreviated presentation because there's a lot more questions. And believe it or not, when you get answers, sometimes it gives more questions than you had when you started. So we have more questions than we really have answers to right now. But I um, want to let you know what we know and, and also open up for conversation. Just to start off, uh, you know, the community budget priorities, the, our first few meetings were really talking about budget priorities. Uh, also, taking priorities from people who are just kind of sending them in, uh, conversations that we've had, emails that I've received, uh, we've taken a look at some of the budget priorities, and these, these are the things that we're looking at when we're establishing our budget. Um, obviously, there will be more priorities coming from the Board of Education, as well as coming from the administration as we go through this process. This has been, um, I think all of you watch the news and, and pay attention to what's going on, obviously you're here, if you weren't here you wouldn't. This has been one of the more... Um, Last year was difficult with the budget, as far as budget was concerned, because we didn't have the state aid runs, and it made it a difficult budget season. This has been a bit of a difficult budget season, and it has been very quiet. Very quiet. And I think you've, you've heard, probably, watching the news and things, that the, the three men in the room seem to be the, the uh, that to extreme this year. So we have very little information coming out of Albany. Uh, and unfortunately, for the timing of this meeting, which I kind of said last night, knowing it was the eve of when the budget was due, um, we did receive some information about 90 minutes ago, uh, and I thank Ms. Heidecker for scrambling with me and Mr. Olson to try to just put something together to communicate with all of you. State budget negotiations and where they stand. Right now, as from what we're told, the state budget negotiations are over uh, for the most part, especially about school aid. Um, as you know, what we've been talking about up to this point has been the governor's increase in aid, his proposal for what the increase was, and the increase that he had proposed was $991 million increase to education. The information we received late this afternoon uh, was that the government spending to education of about $1.47 billion increase. Now, well, you, most of you also know that the regents had asked for a $2.4 billion for um, over $1 million oh, proposed. 
but we do see an increase in overall school aid uh, at this point of $485 million, and that's overall for the entire state, the entire budget. One of the things we've been talking about, you've been hearing a lot about, was GEA restoration. Uh, we know that the Senate and the Assembly took a very hard line on GEA restoration, the gap elimination adjustments that were, that were being made from the governor's um, budget were about $189 million, or about 50% of what was left. You also, most of the people in this room know, last year we received about 85% of our gap elimination adjustment last year. It was distributed and cut up as by need, so there are many school districts who got the reverse of that. They got 15% last year. They thought they'd be in the rest this year. The governor had, had instead decided to do it over two years. Uh, the Senate and the Assembly you know, stood pretty strong on this. And from what we're being told at this point in the, in the new budget, the GEA has been fully restored, $443 million is fully restored to all districts. So for us, what does that mean? Again, I said last year we received most of it. Uh, this year it's $360,000 increase over what was expected, which is uh, a total of about $760,000 for the Kingston City School District in, in what we have as far as uh, G, gap elimination adjustment. Um, the numbers we've been talking about up till then, we've been talking about the governor's budget, which is about, it was, it was about half of what we see there. Any questions on the GDA before we? Okay. I don't have a lot more, to be honest with you. We have a lot of blanks on, the, on our slides moving forward. Um, foundation aid, this was the big piece. For us, it was the big piece because we did receive so much of our GEA last year. We really count on foundation aid for us to move forward. With the foundation aid, the only new money, you know, a lot of times you'll see uh, total numbers of, of what our budget increase is or total numbers of what our aid is, but the only new money the school districts really see come in the form of GEA restoration and foundation aid. So the foundation aid under the governor's budget, as you can see here for the Kingston City School District, was $139,000. So it's $139,000 less than $160 million budget. Not very much in the foundation aid. Program. The governor was, uh, was proposing $266 million foundation aid increase statewide. With the Senate and, and enacted, the, se the Senate and Assembly, I should say, enacted, um, would be is now six hundred and twenty seven million dollars in foundation aid, almost doubling what the well actually more than doubling what the governor had proposed is what would be enacted. Now you would think, I guess logically you'd say, oh well that's probably means we're gonna get double this amount. I wouldn't count on that. And the reason I would say that is because there were two hundred school districts statewide who received no foundation aid under the governor's proposal. So there's a pretty good chance that some of those school districts that receive no foundation aid will receive part of this new $627 million in foundation aid. What does that mean for us? As I just said, we don't know yet. It could increase that number, or it could that number could stay the same. I doubt it will go down, but it, it could stay at the 139, or it could go up. Our, our guess is it's probably not going to go up the, in the same you know, percentage that the total uh, foundation aid went up. The state. Okay, so is, is the 627 million? Is that the total increase? So it's 360 million dollars more than what the governor had proposed. Correct. Okay. Yes. So yes, it's 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 not 627 on top of the 266. That's that that's the increase that's enacted. So like I said, we don't really know what that means for us, which kind of puts us in a, in, you know, especially for evening events like this, kind of puts us in a place where we're not really sure what our, um, you know, what our income, our revenues are going to be. Ms. Custom, you here. Is there any paperwork at all at the budget at all for what we think the existing budget is and what it could be, could be if it just increased to just with cost of living, or if we just moved everything budget? forward? Yeah. Our budget? Oh, yeah. And, and, our last, and actually, that's, that's up on our website. And all our last two budget forms, we talked about our, our uh, appropriations. Actually, I have a slide here to talk about appropriations. What we're really... What, what the, in aggregate or in detail? Like we used to see where we go through... Water. I don't know what you mean by what we used to see. I mean, we, we go, I give it in the... I mean, we, a line by line is not out yet. There's no... 
from last year to this year with the increases that just come you know based on contracts and things. But like health care and stuff, we have an idea of what those health care increases are. We, we will just be. received, we actually just today received our increases in our health care and our and we, we still don't have the increases in our contributions to the Kingston Teachers Federation Trust. So those are numbers that we don't we just don't have yet. But the budget that's detailed goes to the board when? Twenty like first. So between now and then, do we have a chance to look at the line? Oh, between now and then, that will be out, I guess. No, that's that's all right. Okay, so this this slide is a, is a little it's it's not the correct slide, but that's okay. It still tells us kind of speak to what Ms. Custer just asked about. One of the things we what we know these this is the information we've been giving out to this point, all right. And what we know is from last year to this year to keep everything as it is in the Kingston City School District. That means no changes, just stay exactly exactly as you are. And as the increases in you know the projected increases in contracts and those kind of things go up, a rollover budget would make our draft budget at 100, just over 116, just over almost 161 million dollars, which is an increase of about 4.5 million dollars and a 2.87 uh, percent increase in our spending. These numbers at this point mean nothing now. Because we have different revenues that we don't know yet, because we're still waiting on our on our um, foundation aid, so we don't know exactly where we are as far as our uh, estimated revenues are at this point. We do know that our maximum tax allowable taxable levy is 3.37, and we also know that our the goal of the district and the board of education is we will not exceed that 3.37. As of last week. Where we looked at where we were, we were at about 2.77 increase in the, in the levy, which is I should say significantly below the 3.37 tax levy. And that's our tax levy calculation uh, that we talked about uh, a few months ago. And again, as I said, the, the events of today have kind of truncated our, our presentation part of, of this forum, but I think over the next 10 to 12 hours, we should start getting more information that will help us fill in the very important blank, which is that blank. Questions, comments? Can I just go back to the appropriations? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like I said, this is a complete, just a complete rollover. That's, that's no new programs, nothing. It's just staying as is with with increases as far as uh, contracts and such. I have a question from you too. Oh, we have a question from you too. Okay. Um, about the budget, will class sizes stay fairly consistent next year? The goal, you know, the goal continues to be the same with the board as far as what we want to do with our class sizes. Uh, last year, the goal, the board set a target of 22 or fewer students in the kindergartens, first and second. And we are that we intend to stick with that. Um, actually, we'd like to see that you know, it's just be a little below that, even where we were kind of were this year in most places. But that's still our goal is to stick with that target. So, what about third and fourth grade? What's the maximum? The third and fourth grade, we the goal the board didn't give us a target on third and fourth grade as far as maximums are, maximums are concerned. Um, you know, we still try to keep them, you know, in those low twenties, especially when we have bubbles in the district. In the high twenties. Yeah, where, where are you crossing? We have we do I mean, we do we have like five sections district wide that are that are above that twenty four. We don't know anything about it. What's that? We don't know anything about it. About the fourth grade. Well, that's that fourth grade will go into fifth next year. But like I said, there are some there are there are always enrollment bubbles that, that kind of you know boost certain sections. Uh, but again, the, so the if we get more money for the A's in schools. Are we going to get more A's for those classes that are oversized? I mean, if a lot of the, as I said, most of that stuff is funding. And as far as what we what we've been charged, you know, what we've been charged as far as the board is concerned last year, where we put the resources that we have were in that K one two to get those those sections down. Uh, what about the CALP program? Are we going to get more money for the CALP programs? The CALP, CALP program? Well, the CALP program is already you know has been funded this year. Yes, I was told that there was less money this year. There's less program over the school. There year. there was no change in the funding for the CALP program this year. Well, why are there many less CALP programs over? There are fewer CALP programs this year. I was told that. 
Also, what's driving the rollover part? It is budget, um, it's retirement, uh, benefits, you know, what's, what's the... Uh, What's driving the rollover? Yeah, what's, what's well, driving you know, the, in, what's the largest increase? Well, obviously the largest increase is going to be people. You know, it, it's salary increases based on contractual agreements. That's, that's it? I mean, yeah, really. I mean, 75% of our budget, more than almost 78% of our total budget is about people. So, I mean, you, know, you, you look at increases in salaries and stuff and step for teachers and administrators and all of, our, all of our employees. That really drives what our rollover budget looks like. What kind of percentage increase are we talking about? Well, it's about? All, all, all in the contract. I mean, you know, teachers have a 1.4. I think administrators have a little less than that. Um, so those, all, those all drive that. The rollover budget's online. The rollover budget is online. Well, our, our current budget is online, and rollover budget, that's just that number rolled over with what our estimate increases are from the um, That's the what contract. I'm asking. That is online or not? Last year's budget is not online. Not the detail. Not the detail. Thank you. Yes. yes? So in a school that has a very high special ed population <coughs> that we learned last night that might have, the district average is 23% now, when it used to be much higher than that. And some schools, like Crosby, for example, or third and fourth class may have, a, the school might have 27% of its population being special ed. Mm -hmm. And then that school is also now a focus elementary school. So I think the question on class size is something we're concerned with, but we're also concerned with if there is some additional money at all, will, because it's not a Title I school, we don't get extra Title I money to help meet the needs of those Crosby bubbles and those Crosby students who, for me, have the special needs or might be on um, economically disadvantaged. I just wonder how, if the board doesn't say K through two or doesn't say three through four, when there's bubbles like that and we know they're a focus school and we know there's a higher concentration of children that need additional services, how do the community, how does the community, how do parents get a, be a part of this budget process so we can help the board, because many of them are here, to know about it. Because we're trying to get the details so we can understand, has the actual funding for special ed gone down because the number of students have gone down? Or has the price, the cost of special ed gone up? You know, it just, to me, right now, only one in four kids seem to be deemed special ed. And in the past, it seemed like it was much higher than that, so. Well, I mean, I think, I think um, only one in four kids is an, is, is a, is an interesting way to put it, because that's, we're about, 11% higher than the state average as far as our classification rate. So only one in four, 20, 20, one in four kids. But we've, we've hovered right around that 25% um, classification rate since I've been here. So the, you know, as far as funding towards special ed, I mean, fun, special ed drives a lot of, of our funding. And, and as you know, I know you know, uh, last year, one of the board goals was to strengthen that sort of our inclusion model. And we did, we ended up hiring you know, a significant number of special education teachers so we could have that inclusion model where we have, when we have special ed kids in the regular education classrooms, we have a, what we call a consult model where we have a special education teacher in their half day and then an aide in the other half, and the special education teacher goes to the other inclusion, so it's a flip up, so there's always two adults in that class, in those classes, where we have um, that integrated model going on. But, and and that, that is the case at Crosby, as I think you're talking about Crosby. But it's like a one to 14 ratio versus what those special ed students might have been used to with. Uh, 12, 1 to 12. Well, 12, I think, 1. you know, and don't confuse the difference between special, you know, there's a special ed students who are IEP students who are self contained, which are 12, 1, 1, 12, 1, 2s, but then there are also special education students who have, who have learned disabilities, but they're not, it's not necessary for them to be in a self contained classroom. So they have, they have needs within, the, within you know, they have learning needs that can be addressed within a regular education classroom. And that's always been the case. What, what's different is over the last two years, and even more, more profoundly last year, because of the board's um, you know, directives and their goals, we have more support in those classrooms. Those students were in those classrooms before. Those students were in those integrated classrooms before, maybe with a teacher's aid, maybe, maybe with a, a little bit of push in, or one of our models was pull out. And we wanted to get away from that pull out model of students. So we wanted to bring the teacher into the classroom. So we had an integrated classroom um, where, you know, where all students were, were getting the, the curriculum delivered to them, but we also had the special education uh, teacher or teacher assistant in that classroom with them to provide their services right there in real time instead of that pullout. Now, there are still some students who need pullout, and we do that, we, you know, that, that is there. But for the most part, we want to deliver special education services embedded in an integrated classroom. And I just want to talk about Title I for a minute that we get. We don't. 
we just get just a little bit over a million dollars in Title I money, and this is a $160 million budget, a million dollars in Title I money does not go a long way. Um, so, you know, there's, there's not, um, we don't get this huge pile of, of Title I money, which we did, but we don't. Check your email. Anything there? <laughs> we were promised an update by four o'clock, and it's now you know, six thirty. We have nothing. So, compared to recent years, where we went through uh, the transition and closing schools and um, building, you know, planning for building projects, how does this development? Has this been a smoother develop budget development? Well, I, I think it's been. You know, it, we're not. We're not looking. I think the difference is we're not looking at cuts. You know, we're not looking at cuts. We're, in the past, it's been, what are we going to cut? You know, what, what <coughs> has to be eliminated? Um, you know, we look at the rollover budget. We can, we can run the rollover budget, stay below the tax levy limit, and keep things exactly as they are. You know, I, I think we're in a good position where now, when we look at new money coming from the state, we're able to look and say, what are new things we can do? And which is a different, totally, you know, it's a, that's 180 degrees from where we were, you know, three years ago, where we're saying, okay, how many teachers do we have to cut? How many programs do we have to eliminate? You know, and in the very extreme four years ago, how many schools do we have to go? <coughs> so is there zero personnel cuts? We have zero personnel cuts. You know, again, as far as this budget is concerned, you know, we can... Personnel additions. We can, uh, and that, but right now, I would say no. That would depend on what we can learn in the next couple of days. I mean, we, we did hire 35 new teachers last school year. So, I mean, we were able to bring, you know, a lot of new um, people in to, to do the support to our special education, to lower class size. I and mean, that was, again, those are the goals set forth by the board. Those are the things they really wanted to see us do. So, um, we wanted to shore up those programs, the inclusion model for our special education students, as well as lowering those class sizes at K-2. So, you hired 35 school, uh, teachers last year? Yes. But you didn't give any to Crosby? Yes, Crosby, Crosby has, again, we added sections at Crosby. Did you hire them because some people retired, or did you do it because you want to we, we added sections at, K, at Crosby at K through two where we were, where that, that was the directive. We also added teachers at all the buildings, including Crosby, in special education to, to shore up the inclusion model. Yeah, I was wondering if you added teachers because they were retiring, or is it because... Well, that's not an addition, that's a trick. That, that's, a, you know, that's just a replacement. In the detailed line item budget, I've every year tried to figure out how much has the Common Core, how much has the state testing and the changing of methods, how has it impacted our budget? Do you anticipate this year, because I mean, I'm still concerned about technology in the classroom and whether we're going to see the students have more direct impact in the learning with technology. It seems so much of technology is used for the tests, and I'm just still, I'm, I'm wishing that there's less worksheets for my my children in fourth grade and eighth grade and see more hands-on. So I thought at one point we might get tablets that might be available so that the teachers didn't need to use, you know, textbooks, but they would actually have tablets that would have the material on the tablet and that the kids, like some grade, they would start moving up that it would be more of a technological type of learning in the classroom. So I know we've got great smart boards in all the classroom and I know we have a few laptops, four or five for every class, but I'm just not seeing how the learning is impacted by the technology, and that was something I was really interested in, to see how we're utilizing the money, what, if we get any extra money, to really improve the students' learning with technology. That, actually, that's a good question. It's pretty timely, because we've had a discussion about this this morning um, when, with uh, the assistant superintendents and deputy superintendents. But just let me say, we, we do have a pretty um, aggressive Chromebook initiative going on that we're going to expand next year as far as having tablets. And again, you know, Chromebooks aren't the same as tablets, but it is, it is technology in the students' hands. Uh, and we do, you know, we have, the, we have the, uh, the mobile carts for our laptops that teachers can sign out, and we do have our labs. Uh, one of the goals set forth by the technology plan was to have a certain number of, of uh, computers in every elementary class. And, and what we found and what our technology people recommended was that the actual, you know, the, the regular desktop computer was a better computer to have in, you know, stationed in the classroom. And those are kind of war horses. You know, they, 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 they're, they're powerful, they're inexpensive, and they last. You know, we use a three to four year warranty on a, five, you know, or a computer that lasts five years. But one of the things was just to talk about two things. Number one, we just, in cooperation with um, Ulster Boses, 
we just won uh, leaning on asking for, for for next year. So that's one of the things that we wait on these numbers to see if that's something we can put into the budget. So for me, Chromebooks is happening in Ellenville sixth grade class, and that group is going to be having it in seventh grade class. So the teachers were trained in sixth grade, and now they'll have it in seventh grade. So I'm really excited about that Chromebooks idea. I asked my eighth grader, he's excited at the eighth grade level at Miller. I hope it's the same at Bailey. But there, and their social studies teacher, for a full week, they have access to the computers. And for a whole week, it's very engaged technological learning in a social studies arena. For me, I'm hoping that in technology, because he also has the privilege of being in that program, which is more technology driven, but it just doesn't seem they have as much access to actual technology. It's more woodworking. So I was just wondering, you know, is it technology throughout, like elementary, middle school, high school, and technology has a little bit more? So Kingston is like the old IBM school, you know, the idea. Like I thought my kids would go to Kingston and they'd have really great computer experience and technology. Are we moving in that direction so there'll be more computer type classes? Oh, I mean, we definitely are moving in that direction. Even at the uh, at the middle school level, one of the things we've done is that that um, curriculum has been converted from that old from the old idea of what technology was when we all went to high school, where we built we built uh, burn houses and things like that, to more use, to more computer aided design and things like that through uh, through using technology. You had a question. Yeah, um, so we're still waiting on the numbers from the state budget, but I'm you just, have them? Uh, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> you have the computer? I thought maybe you were going to tell us. Uh, I wish that I did. Um, I'm, I'm uh, on the edge of my seat, but I'm curious, um, you know, depending on what kind of funding does come through, what would the school district like to do with foundation aid and that? that influx of state funding. Yeah, I mean, I think that one of the things, and, and the board will weigh in on this obviously over the next over the next month, um, and one of the things, one of the reasons for my meeting with my administrators this morning was after they've got their feedback from the building principles, but I think, you know, we do want to continue to support the things that we've put in place to this point. You know, we, we want to continue that, you know, continuing low class sizes and, and even looking at making them smaller and looking at more, you know, more student or fewer students to, to uh, adult ratio in the classrooms. Those are things we, you know, the board has been committed to, and we want to try to further that. We are committed to, you know, strengthening our special education program, and that that is a very big, a big part of what we're trying to do. And, and as you know, probably people know who've seen me present in the past, you know, I talk about graduation rate all the time. I mean, that that's to me. I talk about graduation rate because everything we do, you know, if, if if our charge is to make sure students graduate, you look at everything you do up to graduation. Uh, the one place where we're, where we're really finding you know, some struggles with increasing that graduation is our special education students. We saw incredible brain gains in all of our other subgroups, but our special education students still are, are hovering in that 45 to 55 uh, percent know, graduation, four-year graduation rate. Our five and six grad year graduation rate in special education students looks you know, much better, but we still want them to see that improve. So that's about shoring up that, that, um, you know, that special education um, program overall. Um, you know, and again, one of the things that we also want to look at is that early is you know early childhood education, UBK. Um, I don't like to call it UBK because UBK means universal. Universal means everyone and we know currently the way it's funded we can't provide it to everyone. One of the things we want to do is to work and again this is probably something that's a that's an extension looking out twenty four months um, to be able to provide more students with that fourth, you know, four-year-olds with that early education in the PCC school district. And um, people know that we do have, one of the proposals I made to the Board of Education was to renovate the Mahar building and create some new classrooms there so we would have the capacity to welcome more four-year-olds into our program. So we, you know, that's, that is a, um, it's a long-term plan, but it's something we have to start planning now. I want to ask you something about sure. that EPA. My child went there last year, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't think there was even a waiting list. Which one? Well, she was at the first nursery. Yeah. Right now we have. Yours? What's that? Do we need more locations for them? Well, we have, we have, and we we've actually have a. We're doing a study right now of how many students we aren't serving and why. So what we know right now is we have about 250 four-year-olds in, in Kingston City School District who aren't attending our. But is it because it's two and a half hours only long and people have a hard time to get at 9 a.m. and pick up at 11.30 because I did that and for me to get it at 9 by the time I went grocery shopping it was time to go back and pick her up so it was more hassle to go back at 11.30 to pick her up than actually you know 
These are, the, these are exact, that's, those, that's exactly one of the questions that we're asking. We have a survey out to parents yeah, right I now. Do, I have a home say, Mom, I can do that. I yeah, can, and let me answer your question, please. And that's exactly what we're doing. We're, just, we're asking people why. If you're not bringing your student to us, why? Is it because of transportation? Is it because it's a half day? Is it because you know, you're, you're going somewhere else? As because you work in Newburgh and you bring your kid down there and, and put them in the you know, child down there. So we want to find out exactly why. What are the things we need to change about our program to put them in? This year, every single one of our UPK slots is filled. We have no, we have no actions of kids want to come in at this point. Well, it's a little late, but there would be there would be a late waiting list. So we and, and we're a partner. We partner with um, our local agencies as well. So it's not just here. It's also we have about thirteen. Yeah, so we have about seven or eight um, private who do, who also do uh, pre-K under our under our supervision. Um, a lot of those, a lot of parents take them there because they do stay that full day. You know, then they pay for the second part of the day. So we've experimented at JFK with a full day program um, the last year and a half or so, and we've seen that that program has stayed full. So yeah, yeah. we're asking. That's that's one of the things that the questions that our consultants are out there asking. Why? Why aren't you coming? But that's that's a perfect question. You're right. That's what we want to know. Well, like I said, my daughter loved it. I am a house stay mom, so I can do that. You can I can do it. I can bring her at eleven thirty, but many people can't. But they have a job. It's very hard for them to get out. I, I knew a lady who was a dental assistant. She went on her lunch break, come back, pick her up, mm -hmm. take her to work. It's a lot of hustle. Right. And I think you know the, the model that we were talking looking at as far as if we if we were to add seven or eight classrooms at Mahar would give us a lot more flexibility of how we can do things. So um, we're we're so part of the money will go to that. We are we are right now in the process of getting the information we need to, to make that happen. And that is board the board of education feels strongly about improving and increasing that program. So that's something <coughs> we've been we've been working on. Were you able to go back to the priority, the sure. community priority phase? Uh, <clears throat> This is not the priorities. Yep. But where were these priorities established? Were they established from the board or from the district or community input? This is this is the list pretty much actually we didn't really even edit it. This is the list that was that was made up during our second budget forum here. Um, so this is what we got from people. And also this I've including there some things that I received from people via email. I got a couple emails of people saying, hey, I missed the meeting, but here are some things that I wanted to have on there. So we put those on there. So this is about people who attended the budget forum. And uh, this isn't this isn't the board's list. This is people who were here. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's what's community budget problems. We also we also asked for efficiencies, and some people had thrown some efficiencies in there. And we wanted to make sure that people knew that we, we didn't not pay attention to that. So to to address these, <coughs> that would be the difference between the tax levy of two point seven seven and to the max, or. Um, Right now you're sitting at two point what is it, two point seven seven? Yes. So it is without doing anything. Right. So if we wanted to do something more, if we wanted to do the full time TAs in the classroom, pay right. classrooms, then that would be an increase to that two point seven. It's an it's an increase in revenue one way there. Which which where's that revenue coming from? Is it going up in the tax levy to, to the to the tax levy limit? Or is it maybe getting more revenue through state aid? I mean those are the kind of things or a combination of the two. Um, I think that that's that's what the board has to decide when we when we come to that and say, okay, this is where we are. This is the this is the tax levy limit, and, and they can say, okay, well, the tax limit is three point three seven. You're pro you're pro proposing two point seven seven, but we want to go. We want that extra, you know, few hundred thousand dollars that we're going to get in that going all the way. So we're willing to go to the taxpayers with that increase. And state officials, you know, nobody votes on the state budget. Nobody <coughs> votes on the federal budget. No one votes on the city budget. There's only two places where you vote on the budget. School district and the libraries, right? So you know, there's there's no one asking. You know, no one's really asking. Um, so so looking at where we are at the it's in. I, you know, I always say, uh, just one of the things I've said all along, you know, every year. I have the same budget goal: to balance the needs of our students with our community's values and their ability to pay. So we so it, it's that fine line that we walk. So again, the board gets a better uh, has, has the feel for that, understands what they how they want to do it and what they want to do with the, as far as the tax levy is. Um, this year has a, it's, a, it's a, an interesting year in Ulster County in that a lot of districts' tax levy limit is very low, very low, because the, it's, we, because of the way our tax um, cap calculation went, because we have, we have building projects, we're a little bit higher than us, so we're able to, to um, go to about that, that 3.37, where others around us, I mean, New Pulse isn't a negative. 
as a, they'll go with a zero probably you know, tax levy. Um, so it's a little bit um, it's a little bit of an odd year as far as the tax levy calculation. But yes, that, that's where that would come. The ability to come from the difference between the you know an increase all the way to the tax levy or hopefully you know, increase in state. And the the uh, K the K two class sizes that was established the, the class sizes by the board that was established at twenty two. That was a, a number that they came up within themselves that was considered sufficient. That was the that was the number the board had asked us to get to, um, and that's what we worked for. We have a lot of class sizes lower than that. Oh, most of, class, class. most of our class most of our class sizes are lower than that. We don't have we have I think I, I don't have that that data right here, but I mean you know if we look at our K ones and twos, I think we have um, four. Classes district wide that are above the 22, um, we have, but our averages are well below the 22. And I use that average number. I know there's because there's some higher and some lower. And when you look at so you look see Meyer where you have a 17 and then you have a 22, somewhere else does bring that average down. But we also have where we have the sections that are above 22. Um, in two of those four sections that we have, it was the principal's choice because we have a class. We have the average in that in those sections would be below 22, but the principal had made a choice working with the teacher, and again, that, that's flexibility I want to give our building leaders to be able to say, hey, you know what, this teacher can handle this group, or, or this teacher you know, wants this size group, whatever. Um, it, it, so I give them that flexibility. So when you look you know, at, at some of the classes, when we say one of the sections, we have three sections, and one of them is over 22, but the other two are 17 and 18. That's the principal's decision on how they, you know, how they distribute their class, and we want to give them at least that autonomy within their buildings because they know their teachers and they know their kids better than we do. Discuss. Um, with the students that um, drop out, it seems that there are many of them have been suspended or have been held back at some point before. Does the district have a plan? And I couldn't read it, and I'm sorry, I actually haven't seen that one-page document. And our Wi-Fi here is not so great, so I can't even get it on my phone. But I'm concerned for those kids that are getting suspended because the first time they get suspended, I just heard you guys talk about restorative justice and stuff. What would it cost to have true in-school suspension for those kids that are going to be a risk somehow to staff or to students, that if they're going to be out of school 20 days or 30 days, to me, I don't think much good is going to happen at home. But they are going to get to come to night school, which we have, and that's four days a week for two hours. So instead of having... 30 hours of schoolwork, they'll have eight hours of schoolwork. Those kids are behind, those kids have behavior problems, those kids might have been in class sizes that were too high or they needed more attention. So if we're doing inclusion and it's helping them earlier, I'm very excited for those other kids. But there are kids right now that I know are on the list, like you said last night, that, to, that might not make it their senior year, might not make it their junior year. But to me, start, as soon as they drop out, or as soon as they sus get suspended the first time, then they're at risk of dropping out. And I just feel like there could be a way that we could do something different for those students. And I just don't know if we have a plan or we've talked about it. And we have several plans, and we have several different things that we're doing. But I, you know, I go back to what I said before. I always talk about graduation. So I always talk about this, the administrators, and when I talk about it, it's graduation. What's the, what are we looking like for graduation? Because, and, and one of the things about who doesn't graduate? Kids who get suspended don't graduate. We know that. That's not, I mean, we know that. Kids who get suspended frequently and for long term don't graduate, right? So how do we system a restorative justice system where when we do have students who violate the code of conduct or we do have students who aren't, who aren't able to, you know, you know really meet, the, meet the, the behavior expectations within the school, reach in deeper and find out why and what can we do to change that? And what can we do to make, make our, our model less punitive and more restorative? And that's that's what we're working on. And again, that was that's one of the, the goals of the dis of the Board of Education that kind of charged us with this is coming up with that restorative model. And we've been working for that. We've also been working at our K through eight level um, on the positive behavior intervention system. And and that is step one as far as creating those expectations at the at the early grade levels of what what's it, what are, what are those behavior expectations, and really really working uh, within that system. To, to create a better environment within the schools. And, but again, I think the restorative justice piece is going to be a, a, a real capstone to that, whole, to that whole project, to that whole process, because we don't want to suspend kids, and we want to understand behaviors, not punish behaviors, because that's not doing anything for us. That's not helping me do what I want to do, and what I want to do is graduate kids. So with this, the taxpayers and our community's ability to pay, 
if we could say the restorative justice piece would cost the Kingston School District $4 million, and if we did that now, therefore we increased our tax levy, it would, to me, save the taxpayers money because less kids would be in jail, less kids would be less, 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 and it would go. So I want to know if there's a, between now and April 21st, when it goes to the board, is that program, is that plan, is those finances available so we could, parents, and we could, community members, go door to door and say, we really want you to support this budget and go to that tax levy limit because we know that in some schools 85% are poor, you know, and are, are on, you know, economically need help, but we need we need a new system. So I love the idea of the possibility of full day pre-K for kids throughout the district with transportation, but at the moment, I'm still worried about those kids that didn't graduate with my son in 2012 for that. I'm worried about my kids that are not gonna graduate with my daughters in 11th and 10th and 11th grade. I'm worried about my eighth grade son's peers who aren't gonna graduate with him in that year. So I'm going, I would love to go door to door and help the community say, we're behind the new high school and we're behind putting the effort into education and restorative justice and keeping these kids out of jail, out of suspension. What would it take? Would yeah, both Miller and Bailey? One, one of the issues with changing to a restorative model is really about changing the culture. It's more, it's, 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 you can't, it's hard to put a dollar figure on that. I mean, we have the capacity to do this. I mean, it's, not, it's not something that we need to invest huge amounts of money in other than other than maybe, I guess training would be where, where our money be in professional development program. Really, it's about changing a culture, a really deep-rooted culture in public education in general and how we deal with discipline in schools. I mean, what do we do? We suspend, we put kids in suspension, or we do, put them in detention. That's what we do. We don't look to, look to see why they're behaving in ways or why they can't meet the expectations or what are the roots and how can we help them. Um, one of the other things that the Board of Education you know, chose to uh, fund more last year was more social workers. You know, and we were able to put more social workers at the middle and the high school levels, so we could have some more pay, some more people to help us with that. Again, one of the administration's requests will be going forward for for more support in that area, and I think that's something that we will we will be bringing forward um, to to look see what what can we do as far as you know providing that extra level of support. And that does everything. I mean, that 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 adds to a lot of things. That talks about school culture. That talks about you know helping us with our PBIS. That talks about helping us instill. The, the whole idea of having a restorative justice model instead of a punitive model. So I, I think it's, it's not huge amounts of money for that. It's, it's a huge amount of uh, talking. It's a huge amount of training. It's a huge amount of thinking differently. And I think that's, that's really about culture. And that's, gonna, that's, that's what we need to change. Change the culture from a, from a punitive model to a restorative model. And both middle schools are focus schools. And both middle schools are the places that you, I know you train the, the staff to be able to, you brought people in, and then parents were invited, but not very many parents got to attend that event. Is there, is there a plan that we could do that next year? And we knew that we could have consistent, regular trainings, not just for the staff, but not just for the students, but for the parents who have to support when those kids get suspended. I would love to see next year, I would love to go door to door in that, saying at both Miller and Bailey, we know that there are issues with behavior and issues with suspension and if we had a certain amount of professional development money but also parent family community development money and we asked the entire community on reducing suspensions between fifth and eighth grade i think we would see that we would move up from that 83 percent to maybe 88 percent that's a really good piece that, that you bring up and i think that when we look at our pis model and we look at our tenant and actually just before we're sitting next to you which are the tenant five which is which is really that social emotional piece uh, and when we get into one of the things you know we spent a year long implementation and training as far around pbis and one of the things we want to do is make sure that it gets into our to our you know our our set plan our school improvement plans and i think part of that school improvement plan should be a re uh, outreach to parents to bring them in to help us make that change and, and I think Mr. LaForce is sitting here right next to you, so I think he heard that, and I'm sure he's already down that road. Mr. Shonsky, do you have a question? Well, just in, in terms of restorative justice, one thing that the, the schools in all of Ulster County are working on uh, that impacts that is uh, the social emotional health of students and trying to understand why it is that students are, are having the problems that, that, that they do. I mean, they come into class and they, you know, and there's an issue. Uh, that leads to a suspension. Well, why did they come into school that way? You know, maybe they, maybe they're homeless, or maybe uh, you know their their father or, or mother was arrested the night before, or something like that. I mean, you know, there's all sorts of issues um, that um, we have to be, we have to be more attuned to, and so the 
the superintendents in the in the county are are organizing a series of conferences uh, on social emotional health with outreach to uh, commu other community organizations that uh, uh, that can help in that regard. Um, and I think that you know long long term that will uh, it'll reduce the suspension rate and it'll. Uh, it'll facilitate the restorative justice model, um, and uh, we'll see a positive impact in uh, graduation over over several year period. And and when and yeah, and Mr. Charles is right right on about what, what we're trying to do. And actually, this board, our board, Kings Board, was was the was kind of the catalyst in that with their with their resolution on creating this opportunity for superintendents to step in and, and really you know take a look at this and provide opportunities. And when money when money is tight, you look for partners. You know, when money is tight, look for partners, and we have partners in this community that specialize in these things. So we want to look for them. And again, each two two superintendents um, have each taken a topic, and we're and we're and we're uh, planning forums and, and conferences with our local experts, and we will be inviting parents, and we'll, and it will take place down at the um, the New Paltz, the Ulster. Um, Ulster Bosey's New Falls Conference Center. The first one will be, I don't want to say the date yet because I have to sold the pencil, so I won't say it, but the first one will be on Harold and Opiates and, and farming. Um, that one's coming up very soon first. And uh, we will also be addressing things like suicide, <coughs> addressing things like transgender uh, issues, uh, and addressing uh, what was the fourth one tonight, bullying and cyberbullying. So those are the kind of things that we're going to, we're reaching out to our community partners to help us talk to parents, talk to our faculty, staff, our board members, talk to the whole community about what's going on in our schools and what can we do. How can we, how can we create an easier line? We don't want to just have a conference and talk about it and then everybody goes home. You know, we, want to, we want to be able to create that connection, the school to the, to the community-based organization connection, the parents to the community-based organization. How can we make sure we root things the right way? Because sometimes, like I said this a couple of years ago, I mean, we can't do it alone anymore. There was a time when we were so well-funded that school districts did, did it alone. We, could, we did a lot of things that we were able to do, but we can't anymore, and we need to reach out to our partners. I want to go back to technology, but one of the biggest weaknesses of this district is technology, because I, I walk out of a classroom in this district and I was still doing stuff from the 80s in, the, in 2000. And I walked into a classroom where I had all the technology I could possibly want, a wee lease. And I asked, how, how is it that every three years, like this June, when I retire, I have to be out of my room by June 30th because they're coming in and all my technology is going out the door and all my new technology is coming in the door because it's all leased. And we've always bought the, the desktops and purchased all this equipment. Why aren't we leasing? And why, why? BOCES years ago in this, in this county said to lease technology because you can't possibly afford to keep up with technology, yet we're still purchasing it. Why aren't we leasing that and saving money that way and seeing that stuff is always up to date? I mean, to have a computer that's five or six years old is so far behind for the kids from what they have some of them have at home that it's not even worth doing we really need to look at a lease opportunity and how other districts are keeping up with technology and i know our technology and it's funny you say that because i mean i've had i've had my local district superintendents come to me and saying to me how are you doing to do what you do with technology um, because I mean, if you every every classroom in the Kingston City School District is equipped is equipped with a smart board. Um, every every have X number of stations um, for for technology in there. The laptop parts are a big part. Um, our 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 uh, wiring, as far as our connectivity and abilities, is is phenomenal. Um, but as far as the the idea, I mean, we do have a planned rotation. And every summer, when we do that plan rotation, but we to three or five. And, and we, we go through we go through a purchasing process with both these. We use, we use our e-rate money, um, which is a, which is kind of like a rate, right. you know what it is, um, you know, to to purchase things. And I think, but we we purchase things till the warranty. And really, what our goal is in our technology plan is when the warranty goes out, we that's when we start a rotation. So we, we go through and rotate through like that. Um, you know, and, and the, the technology plan is right on is right on the website as far as exactly how we do it. But I think that. Um, you know, we can always do better. There's no doubt we can always do better. But I think we we made leaps and bounds as far as technology is concerned. Um, and, and like I said, I, 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 a lot of most of the other districts in Ulster County come to me and say, hey, can can your tech guys help us with this? Because we want to do what you guys are doing. So, and I know that there are some places where there is. I mean, I know you teach in Newburgh, so um, there's a there's a, a much different um, aid ratio and federal funding towards technology for some districts than others. But there's, but I, I think that. Um, as far as our rotation out, but I, I will, I'll, I'll make sure we look at the, the, is there a difference lease, between lease and what we're doing with our E-rate. Okay, Dr. 
one final question on, on class size again. Sure. Um, so universal pre-K has state-mandated class size yes. limits mm -hmm. with uh, teacher-to-student ratios. Yes. Um, at, they're better than one to seven um, teacher-to-student ratio. What happens between that UPK time frame when they're three and four-year-olds and they're moving into the four or five kin kindergarten classroom where now we have a class size max of 30 with a, a, you know, a school board recommendation of 22, but even at 22, you're still looking at a one to 22 ratio. So they just came from a one to seven environment to a one to 22 environment. What happens in that one year that prepares them for that kind of uh, burden? Well, I, I think that there's, again, that, you know, the mandates as far as class size and UPK is, comes, is there aren't any in kindergarten. Right? And you and I have this discussion. Um, but the, you know, and we also had this discussion where I say our average class size in Kansas City School District is 19, it's not 22 in our kindergartens, and we've brought them down. And, and as far as the... the it's still the 1 to 20, 1 to 19. Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. From a 1 to 7. The UPK, our, our requirements of UPK are, are two teachers for every 19. Is that correct, Mr. Uh, 18. It's 18, and eight, 18, and then they have to have a teacher and a TA. If there's 18. 18. Right. right. Maximum of 20, and then they have two Two TAs. That's, 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 Teacher and two, two teachers, teachers. correct. Two teachers. Two teachers. But you go from this great environment to this you know, one to nineteen. That's a, it's a struggle. I, I I see it every day when I go in and volunteer. Yeah, I, I mean, I think I don't I don't think we I necessarily disagree with you on, on the size. I mean, I'd love to see a you know a two to eighteen ratio in every one of our classrooms. I think that's I, I don't disagree with that at all. Um, again, we talk about we talk about it's a funding issue, you know, at this point. Um, where do where do we you know who's going to properly fund pre-K? Who's going to probably? I mean, think about this. So we have regulations on what what we need for UPK to get the funding, but we don't have to have kindergarten. I, that is, that <laughs> so, is the shocker. Yes. Kindergarten's not even mandated. We don't have to have it. You know? <laughs> yes. I so agree. so it's it's an issue. And if you look at the teachers' contract, our uh, what we can contractually put in kindergarten is larger than we can put in fifth grade. Yes. So I mean, there, there's a weird there's a weird thing going on there. Um, but I don't, I don't disagree with you that I think the teacher assistant there, again, that, that's a, a funding issue. And we look and say, okay, well, how do we want to create that priority? Do we want a clear priority where we say, okay, we want, do we want to say, no, let's not do that early four-year-old and do this instead? Um, would that would be a greater benefit for us? I, I think those are interesting conversations that we should have. And this year's seniors are the people who started the first kindergartens that were not half day but full day. So to me, it's like been 13 years since those kids that were seniors got the first, you know, full day kindergarten. And it was parents and communities coming together, asking these questions at budget forums. And they actually made a really good financial cost effective because it was working parents saying, we really need this. So at the moment, I'm, I'm continue to try and really make what we need to happen in kindergarten happen. So I love the idea last night. I just want to say it again. I heard it at... at um, from JFK, the principal, she said, we're doing something special. We'd like to consider the possibility with more funding there'd be a kindergarten academy like we do a freshman academy. There were other things that I heard that I thought was amazing. Like she said, we do home visits. The other principal or the social worker, we do home visits for any kids that are having trouble with attendance. I would love to see, I mean, I know our high school has a wonderful man who's our, you know, who goes out and tries to help those young people who are either have pins or don't have pins and they go out and find them. I believe that if kids are walking on the tracks, or kids are not showing up at school, or kids are suspended, and they're not showing up at night school, I think those people are so important. And if there's any way that we could have another social worker or another school psychologist that makes that school to home connection really good <coughs> for our kindergarten, like we do with our freshman academy, you know, maybe we have to do it for the fifth grade as well. I'm not, I'm not forgetting any level of schooling. I just don't think we should take on more before kindergarten to 12, until we really feel that we're doing state-of-the-art at all seven elementary schools, 
both middle schools and the high school. And I saw wonderful, positive things last night, and I was impassioned, inspired, and the fact that you're giving more choices. But I'm hoping that, you know, I know you're going to end right now, but I want to make sure that you hear <laughs> the survey you talked about comes up on Friday. If any parent community <coughs> member wants to do the survey, you have until tomorrow to finish the survey. If you can tell us when the next budget meeting is, I just, if there's people who are stuck in their homes, I as a parent, a district-wide parents council person, I'll do home visits to people who are worried about the budget and want their voices heard here like you're doing technology. I tried to put my questions in YouTube. I'm so sorry. I'm not technologically savvy, although I have the newest. I couldn't figure out how to do it. I asked the person in charge. He doesn't know how to do it. So yes, parents need training, even those of us who have degrees. This is, I could ask my kid and they could have done the questions, but I really, really hope that the things that you're doing, the way you're texting people, the way you're sending emails, those types of communication is going to help. But there are more people who are willing to be the advocates and that we are working together from the staff to the school board and that this budget process from now until May 19th, it's usually my son's birthday, if there's a way that it's we May 17th this year. May 17th That's my this birthday. year. <laughs> All right, so Dr. Catalina's birthday, for his birthday, you know, if there's any way that we could have more people involved in this budget process, that you can go out to every PTO, every PTA, like right now I'm leaving to do the high school, P the Parents Association, we will keep sharing this message, but this the information, honest to goodness, if the people I go door to door, don't, I don't bring my full detailed packet of the entire budget so they can ask me a question and we look at it, they're not going to be vested, but there are people who do go door to door helping to get our high school plan done and helping to get our budgets passed. I just hope whoever's out there in cyberspace knows that you are listening and that we want to get the message out to them in the next six weeks. The, so no other questions? No other questions. Okay. Um, just go back to the very first minute or so of what you're saying. Um, and, and I, in a discussion, I very rarely say this, but I think that you must have been, that the administration must have given you notes to to say things because you're saying many of the things that they said to me this morning, things that, that they want in the buildings, um, uh, really around the attendance, around the truancy, around the around helping students and parents understand the importance of attendance and those kind of things. Um, so that's that's again, you know, I think it, at the middle school level especially, um, the, Ms. Linton, uh, Ms. Burby, and, and Ms. Bondell have been very adamant about certain things that they want to see happen. And one of those things was, was the return of, of some level of attendance, whether a, a social worker that is in charge of attendance to help us go knock on those doors <coughs> and go to those, to go to those, the, those um, you know, those pins petition meetings and things like that to make sure that we are more involved in what students are doing. Don't say it. I know. <laughs> I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I'm holding it back. <laughs> <laughs> you can't have it back <laughs> Well, I just want to respond. One of my priorities as a board member is is, is early childhood education uh, because there's lots of kids coming into kindergarten who are way behind their classmates. I mean, really way behind their classmates. And if we don't address their problems, or, or if we don't address their the, the, those shortcomings, um, it's going to be much more difficult uh, to have them graduate. I mean, they could, if they come in, you know, with a vocabulary of 300 words or 1,400 words, they're never, they're, I mean, they're, they're, they're really, really far behind. Those could be the kids that don't graduate in 12 years or 13 years. And they need that early support. I mean, our research shows us all about you know all, all about the benefits of, of that early childhood education for sure. I mean, I think, and that, that that extends up into the kindergarten as well. I mean, it's not just. I really that think a lot of it means you know three-year-olds need. I mean, if we could do it for three-year-olds, I would support that too. Because well, the governor has proposed. Let's see what happens. You know, uh, because it starts then. I, I just want to pose a question. Who's heard of the thirty million word gap? It's in Chicago. It's a, a program in Chicago. Well, the 30 million word gap was uh, a study that was done back well, in the early 60s and then also again in the late 90s where they discovered that the trajectory of students was actually was being established between the well, there's a program, zero and three. Well, there's a program that's it's organized in, in, in Chicago. It's run by a, a, a pediatric uh, uh, um, doctor at the University of Chicago Medical School. Uh, where they have volunteers going out into um, 
uh, into neighborhood homes uh, for young children as, and, and, and support parents in how to, how to talk more to their students. I mean, the 30 million word gap is that by three years old, these kids have heard 30 million less spoken words than their contemporaries, you know, than, than other children. And that's just a huge, huge deficit. Okay. I thank you very much for being here. I appreciate it. Again, this is one of our better attendants. I really <coughs> appreciate it. I'm sorry we get more through um, YouTube, but we'll keep trying. Uh, Monday, we will be doing the online uh, kind of same thing. I'll be at K K uh, KHS TV. And I know it's not at, at the greatest time for a lot of people, but we really want to get the kids and the students involved and understand the, the budget process and, and how it affects them. So we want to have them participate and, and be, and then our KHS TV kids just like to do this stuff there. You know, so they're really into making that happen. But so we will we'll have that then. And remember, April 6th is our next board meeting, which is a week from yesterday. And it's a one item agenda. Uh, we're only talking about the budget. So welcome people to come out. Thank you.